Once you've ruled out the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be true. And it is not a question of a little occultism or a touch of mysticism, Mr. Denton. It is vampirism, and there's a host of damned souls at Pelham House. The true God. He's dead. Can't complain. People assume that time is a strict progression of cause to effect, but actually, from a non linear, non subjective viewpoint, it's more like a big ball of wibbly wobbly, timey wimey stuff. You're listening to Paranormal UK Radio. Hi, everybody. This is Irene Allen Block, the host of the Paranormal UK radio show, the flagship show of the Paranormal UK radio network. And with me again tonight is my co host, Mark Johnson. Hey, how are you doing? It's been a while. <laughs> that was only three takes. Yeah, three takes. The, the public won't hear that, but yeah. Um, not yet, they won't, but I'm sure one day you're going to do a blooper. Yeah, I'll do a blooper reel so that everybody hears it. Yeah. <laughs> Right, so you've been in Vermont at the weekend. Uh, yeah, we got to go away for the weekend. Um, first time in a year since uh, COVID hit. So went up to Manchester, Vermont and stayed in a nice hotel, did a little bit of uh, snowmobiling. It was really nice. Plenty of snow? Uh, way up high, yes. Melted most everywhere else. Oh, okay. Well, that's lovely. It's lovely for you. Was that good food? Uh, nice ex- hotel? Oh, God, yes. Plenty excellent. Booze? Excellent. Oh, excellent all the way around. So you had a very good weekend. Yeah, we took uh, uh, my wife's sister up with us and because uh, th- she needed to get out, too. So the three of us just yeah. had a, had a good, uh, good weekend. Well, we're still locked down here. Still stuck in their little houses, unable to go out, and it'll be some time yet, I think. They are they are easing a little bit, you know. Uh, they've opened up some sports facilities. They're also insisting that you stay local to live. Uh, but they've opened up a few sports facilities. I think on Monday the hairdressers are going to open up, and, but not nail bars or anything like that. They're not opening them. I don't know why. You know, if you can do have your hair done, why can't you have your nails done? But still, there you go. And um, uh, in a few weeks' time, a couple of weeks' time, maybe the restaurants and the pubs, as long as you eat outside or drink outside. And then after that, non-essential shops may be opening up. So we may be able to at last get something we need. You guys, even if it's just a book to read, you know, yeah. you couldn't even buy a book. Yeah, they expect you to be locked down with the children and everything. Toys, books were all stopped. They stopped sale on all of those. Yep. You know, for months you're locked in the house with children. You can't even buy them toys for their birthdays or anything like that, or a book to read to keep them entertained, because it's all classed as non-essential. I have to tell you, uh, you I've been keeping up on what's going on over there, and you guys have it a lot worse than we we do. I mean, they are releasing, um, easing up a lot of the restrictions over here with the yeah. vaccinations and whatnot. But we also have a few states like Texas and Florida that are just they just went wide open. They're just in kind of in defiance. People are being sick of being locked down. So, yeah, it's... Well, uh, they're, they're opening up slowly over here because the yeah. last time they opened up, I think, too quick and we got another spike. Yeah. So this time they're opening up more slowly. More people are, you know, half the country's been inoculated already on their first injection and they're already on to their second injection. So we're not doing too bad there. Considering Italy, you know how much I love Italy, so far they've only inoculated about seven people in Italy. And that's about the same size population as the UK. Huh. No? It's, this is... Last year was bad. This year is going to be interesting. That's all I can say. I don't think uh, we're going to be seeing normal for for quite a bit yet. Yes, but Mark, Mark, one good thing has come out of it. I've had a Milan marble floor laid in the kitchen and the um, dining room. 
Well, that's what happens Absolutely having your husband home to, to do it for you. <laughs> mm, yeah. Well, this is it. You know, the kitchen's being done up. The house is being done up. The garden in the summer will get more work done on it. So then eventually I'll more than likely sell it and move back to Italy. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, at the moment it's all fun and games, isn't it? Yeah. So... Right. What do you want to do now? Do you want to introduce her? We've got a lovely guest tonight. Yes. We, to to well, us. Uh, I'm really interested about this guest. Looking forward to speaking to her. Sure. We're bringing on a um, very interesting guest tonight. Uh, her name is Sylvia True. Now, she is the author of a, it's a novel, but it's based on uh, part of her life and her family's life is called Where Madness Lies. And so we'll bring her on to talk about that and what inspired it. So, Sylvia, welcome to the program. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Hello, Sylvia. Now, Hi. Now, uh, Sylvia, a couple of questions. Now, before we really get into the book, uh, what we, we didn't bring up before we talked to you uh, before the show is, now, you're, you were born in England. Correct. Uh, what part oh. of what part of England were you from? Manchester. Uh-huh. <laughs> I knew I Manchester. knew I knew that would pick uh, Irene's Manch- interest. Uh, Manch- what is it Manchonian? Is it Manchonian? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, and your parents were originally refugees from Germany. Correct. Yes, they and both it- actually lived in Frankfurt, and then my father's side fled to England. And my mother's side fled to Switzerland. My mother became Swiss national champion figure skater and was training in England and met my father there. So they married. We were all born in England. And then we moved to the States. He had a, a sabbatical. And we ended up staying for a, a lot longer than they thought they would. Uh-huh. <laughs> like like the rest of your life? <laughs> Pretty much. I, I moved back and forth a couple times. So, But now I'm here in Boston. Did did you move back to uh, Switzerland or to um, to England? So um, we went back to England for a couple of years when my father had a, a different kind of sabbatical in Oxford, and then I, I spent every summer of my growing up years in Switzerland. Okay, okay. I love Switzerland. I know I do too. A beautiful, absolutely beautiful place. Yeah. Beautiful country. It really is. Mm, I've I've driven across Switzerland, uh, spent some time there on the way through to Italy. Nice, yeah. Yeah. Now, you um, have just published a book, uh, Where Madness Lies. Uh, Tell us a little bit about that book and um, how did you, what was your inspiration for writing it? Um, So, I I suppose the the basic inspiration for writing it um, was because it's my family's story. But I think I, another more, I, I would say deeper inspiration was really I've been on this journey of openness for I, I think most of my life. And, and I wanted to put out there a sto- my family's story and, and my story around mental illness because I really think it's important to talk about mental illness and to I, I think we have less stigma certainly now than 20 years ago and certainly then you know part of the book is written um, in the time of the Nazis but it's still an important thing to talk about and I think in my life if I think about what I've done that I think is the best thing I've done in my life. It was raise my children without um, fear and shame around mental illness. And that was hugely important to me. And and it's important that my students, I'm I'm a high school teacher, I teach chemistry. It's important that my students know that as well. So yes, it's about my family. So that's a driving force, but it's really about me being open and honest with my story and hoping that maybe it'll help one or two people. (laughs) Well, I know uh, in the book synopsis, it talks about two different time periods, but one during 
Nazi Germany and another one years later, both dealing with mental illness. Uh, could you elaborate on the types of mental illness that you're a focus sure. on? Sure. Um, so the time period in Nazi Germany was when my grandmother, um, she lived in Frankfurt as well, and she loved her younger sister, Rigmore, who was diagnosed at that time. Initially, she was diagnosed with um, hysteria, which is obviously very common then, and then melancholia. And eventually she was institutionalized and the diagnosis of schizophrenia landed on her. But I don't think that's really what she had. Now, I can't go back and know for sure, but from the descriptions my grandmother eventually um, gave to me, it sounded as if it was more along the lines of a very um, a very strong depression with some psychotic tendencies, which is what I had then much later on. So these sort of illnesses are mirrored in the book. Um, but the time periods obviously are very different. And in Nazi Germany, you know, if you were mentally ill, then things did not go well at all. So it didn't go well for you if there were you fell into several different categories. Right. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. So with the, um, you know, with the book starting in Germany in 1934, uh, Rigmore was a young Jewish woman as a patient at Sonnenstein, which was a premier psychiatric institution. And, but when the Nazis came in, they were working through their eugenics programs and where they, they were, where they, did they clear places like Sonnenstein out? So, no, it, it was this sort of gradual, not that gradual, but it was a this gradual, um, I guess, decline. So it's in 1933, the Nazis came up with their first sterilization law. And many people with many different conditions were sterilized. For instance, well, any mental illness, but also feeble-mindedness, idleness, alcoholism, congenital deafness, congenital blindness. And from 34 to 39, um, at least 400,000 people were sterilized. And it was in the, in the name of eugenics, in, in the name of race purity, you know, getting rid of diseases. And just to, not really to backtrack a little bit, um, eugenics started in 1880 by a guy named Francis Dalton and um, it was it was really a study in biology and many places in the world including the states the states was pretty big you know into eugenics and sterilizations as well but the Nazis really took it to its obscene end um, anyway so the sterilization you know slowly led to the euthanasia laws but they had been planning that for a while, the, the whole euthanasia program. And in hospitals like Sonnenstein, there was actually six big major mental hospitals in Germany um, in which they built gas chambers and they crematoriums, and they actually even pillaged the bodies. And you can really, when you look at this, it's really like the Nazis opening act, you know, Everything they did in the mental hospitals, they did, then did in the concentration camps. And even the doctors from the mental hospitals were brought to the concentration camps to design their gas chambers there. So it, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting piece of history. And um, I just think that the whole eugenics movement is, was terrifying into where it led. And my great aunt, my grandmother's sister, got obviously was caught up in that time period and that movement. Now, I, that's some new information that I had not previously was aware of, that they were actually using gas chambers and crematoriums in psychiatric institutions. Yeah. They yeah. Were. Yeah. Can I, can I read something, Mark, and it might help the listeners to understand? Go ahead. 
All right. Between 1940 to 1941, the Nazis exterminated at Sonnenstein Institute people with psychological disorders, intellectual disabilities, plus the elderly from nursing homes, and lastly, some from concentration camps. Under this secret program called Action T4, the elimination of life unworthy of life, people the Nazis classed as dead weight. Okay. Hmm. In the cellar of one of the hospital's outbuildings, named Hoss C-16, a gas chamber was installed with a crematorium attached. This complex was surrounded by a wall to conceal the building from overlookers, one side of the wall facing the River Elbe and a car park. Patients were brought from mental and nursing homes in buses and taken to the ground floor of Block 6 at C16 and ushered into a reception area. Sylvia, if, if I'm getting any of this wrong, just tell me. All right? No, no, I, I wish you could see me. I keep nodding like, yes, yes, yeah. that's exactly correct. Right, Everything so, you're saying. Right, so they were ushered into a reception area. From there to another room in front of two doctors who fabricated a cause death and a certificate. Then on the ruse of having to take a shower, were told to undress and then taken down to the cellar. The gas chamber was fitted out with several shower heads in the ceiling to look like a shower. The steel doors were shut, the carbon monoxide pumped in, and it took about 20 to 30 minutes to die. The corpses were then collected and cremated in two large coke ovens. Some of the bodies went for dissection and the removal of any gold teeth. Once cremated, the ashes were either dumped on the rubbish tip or shoveled at night over the bank into the River Elbe. On the back of Sonnenstein's work in 1942, Hitler closed Sonnenstein and turned it into a military hospital. Other gas ovens were erected in concentration and extermination camps as the like of Auschwitz for the elimination of Polish and European Jews. The total people thought to have lost their lives in, the, in that year, 1941 to 1942, under Action T4 at Sonnenstein is 13,720. And if I wrote down a note here, Action T14 is all class to Tiergarten Strauss 4, in uh, in the centre of Berlin, where they had their health head office. Wow! And it, it was all organised by that from there. Right, and and actually, the the life unworthy of life um, that Classic. came from um, the people who started really the whole eugenics movement, um, Binding yeah. and Hawk in 1920. So, you know, they were sowing these seeds for a while. Yeah, yeah, but th those words alone, life unworthy of life, it just makes your blood run cold, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It, it absolutely does. It's uh, always the excuse of any government or group, whatever, who looks down on other people's being non-human, subhuman, and gives them their excuse for genocide. Right. It's a shame. Right. You know, not only with the Nazis, but so many others across the world. I mean, everybody looks at the Nazis as probably the most evil people and Hitler, the most evil person in in history. And but yet that's not exactly true. I don't think Hitler held a candle to uh, Stalin or uh, Mao Zedong <laughs> uh, in the amount of people that they uh that they exterminated in their countries. We don't talk about it as much over here in the Western world, but still it's, you know, any excuse to get rid of entire classes or groups of people just to, you know, have your perfect race or, you know, the master race or whatever it is you want or to get rid of undesirables is, uh, it's pretty bad. Right. Right. So, so, Go ahead. I'll oh, carry on. No, no you I'll, carry on. Right? I will, no, I will defer to really you. I'll gun the boss. Carry on. <laughs> uh, so with, uh, with your family and this book being based on that, you know, you've changed some of the names for the book and some of the details, uh, but the, the 
but bones of the story and insights are true. Can you give us more information about the true scope of this tragic part of your family's history? Yes. Um, so what happened in Germany with my grandmother and her sister, you know, is all based in fact. Some of the, like, one of the main characters, the family doctor, was more fictionalized. Mm -hmm. The reason being is because it's very difficult for people who fled from Germany um, during that time to share what happened. And one of the interesting stories in this book, and that is a, a true story, part of this book, is that my grandmother and mother actually ended up choosing to share this. They had meant to take what happened to Rigmore and her mental illness, they had meant to take that to the grave and never tell anyone. But what happened coincides with me. So I, I was born in England, as we talked about. Um, when I look back at myself, I think I was probably depressed most of my life. And I was always told to pull up my socks and not be so oversensitive as if being sensitive is a bad thing. But that was the way it was. And, and I knew that in my family, we could never show any signs of mental weakness. I mean, it, we weren't told that specifically, but it was clear. And there was this aura of, I think, fear and secrecy that children and you know children pick up on these things and i definitely picked up on it i and i you know i tried to fake it through much of my life and i did an okay job but then in my 20s i was really struggling i was getting more depressed i had terrible panic attacks i couldn't leave the house i couldn't drive and i had no idea what to do i i didn't know where to go for help and you know i, I wasn't allowed to go for whatever reason, which I understood later, to, to seek any psychiatric help. And so I thought, oh, I know how I'm going to fix this. I'm going to have a baby, which, of course, is a wonderful thing, but it didn't exactly fix uh, my mental health. So it was after my first daughter was born that I, I then had a postpartum on top of a really long lasting depression. And I ended up in a hospital around here called McLean Hospital. And it actually, Weirdly, I mean, that was a huge gift for me, unlike, you know, sort of what happened to Rigmore. That didn't happen, obviously, to me. And I, I got the best education of my life there. And the doctors, you know, the first one of the first things they ask when you go into a place like that is, is there any mental, you know, any history of mental um, illness in your family? And I was like, absolutely not. They're all perfect. I'm the weak link, blah, blah, blah. And I really, you know, obviously I believe that. And initially my mother and grandmother, um, they couldn't even talk to me when I was in the hospital. They were so terrified. But, you know, thankfully they became brave and courageous. And my grandmother slowly revealed, you know, bits and pieces of what had happened. It was very difficult for her to talk about it, obviously. And as I said before, she expected to take it to her grave, but it was a huge gift for me and my family because it, it sort of brought us out of the dark and into the light and things began to make sense about my family and about the fear and about the secrets. And um, so pieces of the past in Germany were given to me, but certainly not in the depth to write this as a completely true story. I mean, I had to do a lot of research and, you know, sort of build on characters that I only had little bits of information about. And the doctor, the doctor part was uh, something you built on, yes? Right, there was a family doctor and um, I knew a little bit about him. But and he's a, a major character in the book. But mm. yeah, he is he is mostly fictional, and you know obviously I, I wasn't there when they had their, you know, struggles and conversations and some of that. I knew bit again new bits and pieces and then built on that. Is it is this the doctor that linked into the Anne Frank family? Because I've been to the Anne Frank's house, Anne Frank's so, house in Amsterdam. 
And uh, I picked up a hell of a lot of sensations from that place. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. No, this um, that doctor who was the doctor of Anne Frank's family is my real grandfather on my oh. father on my father's side. Mm-hmm. Um, he, they, in fact, he um, he had to be like literally pushed on a train to get out of Germany because he did not believe that the terrible things that happened were going to happen and. He he's really struggled um, with depression as well after that. You know, it was really he he was just such a kind, gentle human being. And, uh, you know, it really affected him greatly, obviously. Uh, Irene, mm-hmm. did you catch that? What? What she just said about her grandfather literally being pushed onto a train. Remember, remember what we were talking about earlier? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, I'll give you just a little bit of background. Uh, right. Here's, I, I need some. Sylvia? Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious. Um, no, you're curious. Don't be curious. Yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll do this, as Irene says, in the, in the least hairy-fairy way, but Irene is very sensitive. And um, before... She's been fascinated with your book has really been calling to her and she was for doing two, two reasons, really. One, I uh, had a very emotional experience in Anne Frank's house in Amsterdam. And another, I've had another experience in my own house to do with a, a young girl from a concentration camp. So... Yeah. Carry on, Mark. Uh, so, like, uh, I'll, I'll say, I'll say a word like a vision. And just before the show, Irene was sitting and and uh, having information visions playing out behind her eyes, and she saw a man being like forcibly pushed into. We didn't, she couldn't tell if it was a building or or some some kind of something. But when you just said that your grandfather was literally pushed onto the train, that just struck me right there. Wow! Yeah, and I just saw a hand in the back push. Right. Wow. There was also something, and maybe and maybe this will have something to do with your story or not. But I'll just mention it. Something to do with two girls. Two younger girls playing. Do you remember any more of that, Irene? These two young girls got off the bus, and they were as they got off the bus, they were teasing each other and playing. Okay, like the young girls do. Right. And then all of a sudden, they were uh, ushered towards a door, uh, and this was Sonnenstein. They were ushered towards this door, and from there, the whole atmosphere changed. Wow. Depressive ex- atmosphere took over. So from that happy go lucky two children or two right. young girls messing around as they got off a bus to get to the door and then suddenly whoomp. Wow. I don't know. I think my grandmother is visiting. Maybe her sister. I just so you know, I mean I, I don't know. Um my, <laughs> that happens often. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I'm not surprised. So I'm a huge believer in the paranormal, and there is a character in the mental hospital in, um, in the in the 80s in my part of the story who does have visions and who sees Rigmore, um, like behind my grandmother. Now, it's interesting. You know, I put that in there for a couple of reasons. I mean, the book isn't really primarily about the paranormal at all but for me it's an it's a very important aspect in that it it sort of pushes the grandmother to be a little bit more open-minded I think about different types of experiences and and in the end it comforts her as well um and I I guess for me it's also important because I love to say to my students and my children you know only a closed mind is certain and a a lot of the theme of this book is becoming open open 
to listening to other the other basically to understanding where their fears lie because that's really how you gain empathy and it's through the grandmother telling me the granddaughter um, about this terrifying past and it's the granddaughter finally understanding you know the, the grandmother wasn't always the easiest person she was very strict and controlling and controlling for understandable reasons because she couldn't control anything that happened to her in Germany so you know she tried to control all the little things but it's through this openness and through this understanding of the other's fear that the two characters really finally gain empathy for each other and can move out of a place of fear and into a place of love it sounds a little cliche but that's really an important theme and the the paranormal aspect for me plays into that because it pushes on that boundary you know and and for me in my life the whole the whole paranormal journey that i've been on has been probably the most amazing journey i've had well i can i just ask you one other thing you, you could say say no if there's you could say whether this is right or wrong did she use a stick my grandmother at the end of her life yes there you go mark that's like i saw last night mm -hmm. yep yeah that that's fascinating yeah she showed me i out i lay in bed last night i wanted to see summerstein and I, i'm classed as what says like a seer and i asked to see in my mind, I asked my subconscious, uh, show me Sonnestein, okay? And this little old lady with a stick walked me into the building. Wow. Hmm. And I, I told you about that this morning, didn't I, Mark? Yeah, I'm getting chills. Wow. And unfortunately, uh, got to a certain point in it. She, I was watching, I was watching these two men uh, taking notes from people and writing stuff down and then my husband walked through the bedroom door with a cup of tea and it broke the whole thing so, so that's really I lost interesting, her. interesting. I lost her. can you hear me yes go ahead uh, oh sorry you lost okay so the the taking notes thing is very interesting to me because what they did there you know the germans documented everything right oh one other thing she showed me was clothes that had been like somebody had taken their clothes off and put them very neatly in a pile yeah well that would make sense if they were telling people to go take showers and having them right. strip all their clothes yeah right. but there was, this particular little area where these clothes were these, it's like somebody had taken them off and folded them and put them neatly into a pile. Hmm. Not flung them on the floor or ga been gathered up. They were neatly piled in, as if this person was used to folding their clothes when they got undressed and putting them in a pile. Right. Well, that's interesting. Certainly, my grandmother was fastidious about being tidy. Oh. <laughs> Oh, so right. maybe maybe I maybe I met your grandmother last night. I think you did. If I, if I did, I'll tell you one thing: she's a lovely lady. Yeah, <laughs> she was a very interesting, complex, very smart woman. Um, but she didn't a, take it. This would this you know she she didn't take. Um, uh, what we say over here, she doesn't, she didn't take stick from anybody. No, she stick, yes. But she wouldn't take nobody putting them wool over her eyes. No, absolutely. Very true. Absolutely. Mm. That's the lady I saw last night. Yeah, time. very strong and, right, mm. difficult at times. Yeah. <laughs> That's my impression I got. <laughs> That's so interesting. Mm. Yeah, this is wild. I'm sitting back here just like in amazement. Yeah, but, you know, Mark, this happens to me. Yeah, you know, the, we haven't had often. really had something like this happen in quite a while. Yeah. So it's. Uh, but I it, asked specifically last night. I wanted to see Sonnestein for myself in those days, what it was like. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see what the people were like. 
And if she was tied in with her sister, the, her sister or anyone that was at Solestein, then, you know, she, from where she is now, she, she has passed over, I presume. Yes. Mm -hmm. From where she is now, she could take me wherever I wanted. If I wanted to go to Australia and say to her, you know, show me this, she could do it if she wanted to. Right. Huh. Now, you know, with people who, and, and it's, this happens and even may still happen today, but I know it happened up to very recently. People with paranormal or psychic abilities were considered yeah. to have some form of uh, schizophrenia. Um, Especially they in were, the Victorian times. Yeah. Can, you heard voices or people talking to you. You were committed. Uh, put on heavy doses of lithium. Um, so, yeah, it was a, very much a stigma. It's really in, in the last 15 years or so where the paranormal has really gotten more into uh, the mainstream with all the television shows and whatnot that, you know, it's it's definitely becoming more accepted, although, you know, you can still talk to a lot of psychiatrists who who feel that it is, you know, they don't believe it, and it's still a mental illness. So there's still a ways to go. And with mental illness in general, what you were explaining and what you were you grew up with, um, you know, I have no problem mentioning that I I suffered from the same thing. Now I had an identical twin brother, and he passed a few years ago, but he and I both grew up with extreme depression and. Uh, it was to the point sometimes my parents didn't know how to handle us. And this was back, you know, in the late 60s, early 70s, where, you know, they just didn't have, they didn't know how to handle uh, children right. who were like that. And it didn't, it took me a very, very long time to finally, you know, find medication because they didn't have it back then. And uh, once I was able to get on some medication, I, I've been fine right? You know, with some adjustments along the way. But, you know, I understand how that feels, because when you when that that type of depression, which for me was a clinical depression. Right. And when it hits, I mean, the lows it brings a person down to with the self-loathing. I mean, you beat yourself up for every little thing. You become very antisocial. Don't you feel like you're not worthy to talk to anybody? And I was never suicidal, but, you know, it was just how you withdraw from everybody or a person could say one word to you when you're feeling fine and all of a sudden your whole world just comes crashing down. It's like sometimes it's like flipping a light switch. Right. And no, it, I hear you. I mean, you're just describing me. Thank you. <laughs> you did a great job. Okay. <laughs> so we have that in common and, right. um, you know, but again, how it was treated back then compared to now, which now most people are dealing with some forms of depression, which, but I believe a lot of that is directly brought on by our society, right. uh, the stresses of society we have nowadays. But still, you know, in the old days, they used to call it melancholy. Right. Absolutely. You know, someone is, oh, they're just sad. It's their melancholy. You know, they've been not realizing that it was a, a form of mental illness. Right. Right. And I, you know, I went into um, the hospital in 1984. And, you know, fortunately, there was a, a medication then that was called Nardil that helped me uh, tremendously. That was before Prozac was around. Um, but, yeah, there's so much more hope for this now. And, it, you know, and there's still some stigma, but it's very, and as I said in the beginning, it's just really important for me that my children, my students know that, you know, this is such a treatable illness. And it certainly wasn't in Rigmore's time. Um, and, you know, what happened to her was, was horrible. And this story sort of takes place you know, you sort of see it goes from darkness, you know, to this light at the end, this hope. And and again, I mean, not and I agree with you with the paranormal, too, that, you know, we've come a long way. And I I teach chemistry, but 
I, um, I also teach a course called Science in the Media, and it's not based on textbooks, right? We just do readings of interesting things that happen in science, and there are so many of them, obviously. And it's almost always, one way or another, we end up on the paranormal. And I've done a ton of research, and there have been great studies out of the University of Virginia. I'm sure you know all of those. You know, and I present those some of those to the students. And it's very interesting to watch the students because when I ask them, you know, have you had any experience with the paranormal or know anybody, you know, anybody in your family, they're often hesitant to start talking about it. But once one opens up, it ends up without fail that all of them either know of somebody or have had some kind of experience and you know then become more comfortable talking about it but it you know for example my family was this huge line of scientists and it was you know it was just completely not you know you were an idiot if you believed in that sort of thing right i mean that was you know for other people but intelligent people didn't believe that and i remember when i got out of the plane and i finally felt better because i finally wasn't depressed the whole world sort of opened up to me and i became very curious and i met this guy and he told me his mother was a psychic and i was like yeah no i don't believe in that that's not that's nonsense but i was very i was curious enough to keep to keep moving slowly forward and I ended up seeing her and and um, she became my psychic for 30 years she died about a year ago she was the most amazing person and she read regular cards not tarot cards and regular card playing cards were actually invented for fortune telling initially and she told me things even in the last year when she had dementia and I thought she didn't know what she was talking about she told me things that over and over again came true you know she was more of a psychic but she had mediumship abilities as well Mm -hmm. and it's just it was so it was so mind-blowing and it really opened up my mind to so many other things and it's been such a great thing to study and my daughter calls me the medium hunter because i I like to visit mediums Um, i'm running out the door now (laughs) No, don't. <laughs> anyway, it's just yeah. been a, a fascinating journey. Now, w- with that be- being said, have you had many of your own paranormal or experiences or any experiences with having visions? So I've had, certainly I've had uh, dreams that I, could, I now see as clear visitation dreams. Um, I've always wanted to have more of what Irene has. Um, you know, I have some intuition, but I don't. I don't have, you know, a great ability um, to have visions. But, you know, I. I think some of my my best experiences um, have been through actually this woman Sophie, who was my psychic, and some of the things, some of the stories and things that she told me like i'm this is this is probably saying too much so i'm i apologize but um i'm presently happen to also be going through a divorce and um her son was the one who told me about her 30 years ago and you know that was after i had just gotten out of mclean and i you know was going through a transition and i was divorcing my first husband and so her son and I had a, a relationship. Um, and then he moved to California. I stayed in Boston. We each had children. So in the last year of Sophie's life, she kept on saying, an old boyfriend's coming to town. I was like, I don't have any old boyfriends. It's ridiculous. And um, she kept on telling me this. And I thought, well, if it's her son, then she would know that. But she didn't know it. And she just kept repeating it. And she also told me that I was missing a very, very important document and that I needed to find that document in order in order to like save me from losing a lot of money. And I knew my father was dying at that time too. He also died about a year ago. And I thought 
you know, I was the executor of the will and I thought she must be talking about that. Um, and I said, are you talking about my father and his documents? And she said, absolutely not. No, no, no. It's another document. And I couldn't figure it out. Right. So then sadly she died. She was 91. Um, her son comes to town for the week of the funeral. And of course we reconnect. And so everything she said came to be to pass. And then I lost my prenup that I signed. <laughs> <laughs> At, oh, which I did eventually find in the attic in a box of my daughter's second grade art project. So oh. it's just very interesting that um, that the these things are real, you know, that people, you know, it, it makes you just, it fascinates me about the world and life and what's fate and what's free will and all of those questions. Well, there, there's so much uh, that we're here to experience, and you know we could get into some very deep conversations uh, in regards to that. Even you know, people who claim, "Well, why am I going through this? Why am I suffering from this depression, a disease, just like somebody who has cancer? Why am I experiencing this?" And you know, why is God doing this to me? That's another one. People are looking to blame somebody else for for it but you know we are we're all here to experience things both good and bad and i think even with the mental illness is is a challenge it's a, it's a challenge not so much to overcome or endure but it is something that you know we live to experience and that experience adds to something within our core spiritual being so right yeah, you know, these these uh, you know you talked about some of the dreams that turned out to be visions. I've had a couple of my own. Um, you know, I've mentioned on our show before. I dreamed about nine eleven two days before it happened, but it was wow. very symbolic. So I didn't put two and two together until two days after nine eleven, when it all suddenly hit me like a ton of bricks. When I remembered the imagery of what I saw in my dream. You know, I've had uh, other dreams where things seem either, you know, precognitive or I'll have dreams that are very symbolic and are, are detailing things that are about to happen in my personal life. You know, nothing earth shattering, you know, for the nation or, or the world or anything, but very personal. And right. like I used to dream about tornadoes. And whenever I had a dream about a tornado, it never failed within 24 hours. Some kind of personal turmoil would suddenly hit me <laughs> that wow. I'd have to deal with. Wow. And again, tornado some symbolizing its whirlwind or turmoil. So I learned about to, to read a lot of those symbols, those dream symbols. And it's uh, it's it's interesting, you know, the visions that you get, too. I mean, I I. I am by no means call myself a psychic, but I've been in places too, like how Irene said when she felt when she visited the Anne Frank house. I've visited places and I've gotten some impressions, but it doesn't happen all the time for me. Right. But we, uh, yeah, we we've, we've both been dealing on on our end. We've both been investigating the paranormal and dealing with the paranormal. Well, you a lot longer than me, Irene. Well, not that that see. was an age crack or anything. Nearly seventy years. <laughs> <laughs> gotta be, gotta be. You know, well, investigating it, I would say fifty. Wow. Mm. Right. So what's your, like, most, I don't even know the word, I, I'm going to say phenomenal experience? Can uh, I ask? Oh, with me, all my experiences are phenomenal, so to speak. Right. You know, uh, I, I, how could you explain me, Mark? 
Uh, we had to come up with a term for her. We call her an extra sensor <laughs> rather than uh, the typical words yeah. of psychic or medium or whatever. None of it really applied. Um, but she... My, go ahead. I was just going to say the, the story in the fact is that I am connected to Konichiwa, which is a Brahm seer. Uh, related on my mother's side, my great, my grand, my maternal grandmother's side, and wow. he dates back uh, in the history books. I think is about they say he lived in the 16th century or the 17th century, but apparently the true Brahmsia lived 100 years before what they're saying in the books. So, with me. I don't know what I am. I really don't know. And I don't know how to explain me. I'm, Irene and I have known each other for well over 10, 12 years yeah. now. And uh, during our conversations, things will happen. We'll have a lot of strange things happen. Even while recording this show, we have strange things happen. So, like, what uh, she was experiencing before... We brought you on being directly related to your family's history and the visitation she received last night. That's part of what she experiences all that's the time. That's so cool. Plus, she lives in a house I've, with I've, three ghosts, too. Yeah, so, yeah, I've got three ghosts, but I also, you know, I have this gift of if I want to see something, I don't have to leave the house to see it, I just put it in my mind that I like Soniston. I want to see Soniston. And right. I'm taken back on a timeline to a particular event. Wow. And it is absolutely, this is what I like. I don't like going anything to do with the future, like my uh, uh, past relative who was a seer of the future. I don't like that. I don't want to know what's happening in the future. Although right. I've I have seen stuff before. Well, that's the thing is that I've done all of the I've done all the usual thing. I've come up from doing the medium stuff to trance mediumship, and I, I've gone off in stages. Uh, to me, they've been learning processes to what I am now and where I am now. But I don't do it. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm a grandmother and a radio host. <laughs> You know, I don't do anything as a profession. Right, right. No. If, if something happens, I see something, I tell Mark, or he writes it down, we leave it at that. We've seen um, terrorist attacks, haven't we, Mark? Or I have. Yes. Um, and they came, we documented them, and then they come, they'd come true. We've had, when that Malaysian airplane disappeared... You were doing remote views on that, and we found, well, I, sh I should say you, in your remote views, found and plotted where the plane went down before any uh, anything came out in the news, which was it flew all the way down to Australia before it ran out of fuel and then ditched in the ocean. Now, they never found the plane, but that's where they fig they suspected where it was, and... We even had I've even a, drawn that on a map. Yep, you drew on the map, like the <laughs> X marks the spot. Actually hit the water. Yeah, and wow. all the search areas that they were doing were not too far away from there. So yeah, they're missing it every time. But but she also was able to, through her remote views, see not only what had happened, uh, not exactly what had happened, just that it whatever had happened, the passengers had no control over it and they went through the stages of you know anger grief and then fear and then eventually acceptance right. uh, that, that it, was a remote view but it's not always remote views some of them are like visions mm -hmm. you know i could be sitting there having a cup of tea and then all of a sudden it's like a a film plays out in my head or, you know, and I can see something happening, it's going to happen, or this is happening at the moment in real time somewhere else, or in the past or whatever. Or, like I say, occasionally in the future, I've detected terrorist attacks long before they've happened. 
and I've actually told Mark exactly where they're going to happen and when they're going to happen or what. And he he documents everything, and then we wait and see what happens. Wow. I... You know, it's um, it's not to me. It's not a gift. To me. It just I think you shouldn't look at it as a gift or a curse. It's just it just is. It's part of who you are. You know, and sometimes yeah. we need to accept those things about us, you know, whether we like them or not. And it goes back to uh to Sylvia with your book and talking, you know, about depression and or about the uh, mental illnesses. They are a part of who we are. And they're part of our life and learning to deal with it. And right. Yeah, but Mark, when you go and you're talking to somebody and you smell death on them, and then within two days or whatever, they die. You know, that earthly smell, you cannot... And I go through all that as well. I know when someone's going to die. I know. It is a hell of a lot to carry. Right. I just don't know where it all comes from or why. And I've tried to stop it. I've tried to shut it out. I've tried to be like anyone else, but I oh, can't. Oh, God, you fought me on it for years. <laughs> yeah, I know. Mm. Yep. That's why uh, she she doesn't really put herself out there that much. And this has been happening for over 50 years. Wow. And the, the longer it goes on, the stronger it gets. Now, so if you, seems to, go ahead, Sylvia. So have you talked to like other mediums or psychics about these things or no? <laughs> I've never found a medium or anybody that's got the knowledge that I've got on this sort of thing. They can even keep, I'm not being big headed or anything, but they can't keep on up with me when I try to talk to them about wow. it. Can you you understand that, Mark? Don't you? Yes, I do, because we've experienced that firsthand, and we've had many psychic mediums on the show. Uh, we even had uh, this one lady over in the UK who I like her a lot, and she's a channeler, Elaine Thorpe. I don't know if you've ever heard of her, but if you yeah. look her up on YouTube, she has a lot of uh, YouTube videos. She channels a spirit named Jonathan. And it's her channeling. Most times when I hear, see somebody channeling and they get into these weird high-pitched voices or they do something, it just seems so fake. I just want to blow my brains out. But with her, she normally has a very higher-pitched feminine voice. But when Jonathan comes through, you swear to God, you're, you're hearing an English gentleman talking to you. The voice wow. comes. Victorian times. A voice completely changes. You have no idea it's a woman uh, talking. And uh, you know we've the interviewed Jonathan. Changes as well, doesn't it? Her demeanor, everything, her face, everything changes. But even then, you know, and and this is by no means me saying that I believe she's faking it. I do not. I think she's being genuine. But sometimes with these channelers, the information that comes through is so it's very simplified. If you under if and maybe it's being simplified for a general audience, but you know, I feel like you know I you know, Irene could run circles around them. Right. Right. Only because I've blown your brains off a few times with some of the stuff I've said. <laughs> Just a couple of times, yes. But, I, yeah, I I think I know what you mean, Mark, in that, uh, you know, the specifics, you know, are are hugely helpful in telling. And in, in if they're too, if, you know, I've been to a, enough mediums, and I, I have run up against a couple of pretty big frauds, which... Is so mm. interesting and in a, in a way legitimizes the the real ones. I I think it doesn't mean everybody's a fraud, but you know there are some of them that are just like sort of well, I feel a mother energy and you know I don't know they they don't give enough specifics to make you feel like do they really know? Um, but I've had some such phenomenal readings with such specific detail. Um, that I know that there are, are certainly real real mediums and psychics out there that are amazing. 
Yeah. And see, I've never you had... You see, like, I, I started as a child and uh, really never done anything about it except to talk about the... My mother always told me, I said, if everyone's going to see a ghost story, it's me. You know, I was born in a haunted house. That was her words. Every <laughs> time I mentioned something to her about anything whatsoever. And but then I went through the medium stage, then I went through the trans medium stage, and then I went through some other stage, another stage. And to me, it was all learning stages, things that I had to learn to get to the like I said, where I am now. Now I can sit back and stuff just flows comes to me and goes whenever it wants and I just take it or leave it. You know? The what we were talking about earlier on, I was on my a treadmill one day and I had earbuds in and I was listening to music and well I was walking away there at hundred mile an hour sort of thing on this treadmill. And all of a sudden this young girl appeared in front of the treadmill and I you know, I just watched her for a while. And I knew that she was from a concentration camp. Although her hair was grown then, I also knew that at one time it had been short. All these instincts, all these things were being fed through to me. And then I was, I saw the concentration camp. I saw a man laying emancipated up against a fence. And he was dead. He was totally dead. And she kept on about being... They put me in yellow. And she was unhappy about this as if she shouldn't have been in yellow. Well, I took it to be yellow clothes. But I'm not so sure now. It could have been that yellow star that the, uh, they were given to the Jews, right. the Polish right. Jews. And she was trying to tell me that she shouldn't have been wearing that star because she was not a Jew or whatever. You know, and it was so strong. And, and the... The whole emotions and the feelings that came through, the emotions of being there in that concentration camp back in the 40s and everything was just flowing straight through me. And, of course, I told Mark the following day, but you, that's one you didn't document, did you? I thought no. I did, but I can't, we talked about that earlier today and I couldn't find it. So, But it's been a long time. That was several years ago. <laughs> Yeah, it was several years ago, but it's never been, I've never forgotten it. That's one of the reasons why it was so important for me to talk to you tonight, to read this book, because I want to, I know I will, I, I, I will be able to live it. I will be able to live through your words, even though you wrote it as fiction or part fiction, right. I will still be able to write, live through that and get to various places that I want to see and get wow. to and feel. I would maybe be able to feel your grandmother, your great grand I'm um, your grandmother's sister. Right. Uh, and to me that, you know, it's just part of who I am. Well tell them I said hello. <laughs> yeah. Uh. yeah, I will. All right, then any messages? Yes. <laughs> <As I said. laughs> well, you, you know this... Oh, it, I you, something about a cake. Do you want a cake? A cake? <laughs> you, you know, some people might think we've gone completely off the topic, off the rails here, yeah, but yeah, actually, I, I really, I really do think it's all, it's all connected. And there's a reason for bringing all of this up because, you know, not only are we talking about People like Irene and even yourself, uh, Sylvia, and, and your your psychic you go to, anybody from the past were considered mentally ill and could be locked up. And there's a stigma attached to it. And yes, I, would have, I would have been locked up if it was Victorian times, I oh, tell yeah. you. <laughs> well, that's why most people, you know, stay underground or don't say anything. And even look at you, Irene. For yeah. you, I don't say anything to anyone. You don't say anything either. to anybody. You go about your life. And even if you see something, feel something, you just keep it to yourself because you don't want it out there. You know, you don't well, want to be judged, judged or labeled. And no. that's a stigma for people, even people with, you know, with mental illnesses. There's a stigma and labels and you don't want to be labeled. You know, you just want to, you know, live your life as normally as you can. Now, Sylvia, with, with your book, 
How do you feel that we as a society are dealing with mental health issues 80 years on after, you know, from what would happen back into the 40s? And what's your message to anyone who's currently suffering from mental health illness or issues? Well, obviously, we're dealing with it, as we talked about, in much, much better ways. But there is still stigma. And I mean, for me, it's the most important thing that, again, I could tell my students or my children is there is help. And if the first doctor doesn't help you or the first medicine doesn't help you, just don't give up, you know, because part of being depressed is an overwhelming feeling of hopelessness. So you're feeling so hopeless, but you have to sort of tell your brain over and over again, don't give up. There is hope, even though you're not feeling it. It's like you really have to consciously remind yourself of that. And, um, and you know, when I, I remember when my eldest daughter showed her first signs of depression I, I think she was around 14 or 15 and um i uh i took her to a, a therapist a psychiatrist and a psychic so i was going to cover all the bases and made sure she got the help and she did and you know in many ways the psychic was the most helpful not to say that the others weren't believe me i i'm not um saying you should do one or the other i think you should seek whatever help you can get and and really trust your gut in what works for you Mm -hmm. no uh i definitely agree with that definitely agree with that and you know who knows where we can go from here actually you know here's a question that for you being that you are a high school chemistry teacher so you understand chemistry and then there's brain chemistry and right. some people who have, like myself, clinical depression, they say, oh, well, it's an imbalance of chemicals in the brain. And sometimes I wonder if that's the case. Is it chemicals? Is it maybe spiritual? Is it something else? You know, uh, I understand that, you know, being physical beings and we have a lot of chemicals and hormones and other things running through our bodies that could affect us greatly. But, you know, what was what is your opinion when you start thinking about this, you know, and how it affects not only mental illness, but maybe even the paranormal? Do you think it's more chemical based or do you think uh, it may be in a lot of ways that maybe it's more spiritually based? That's such a great question. I, I, I wish I had the answer. I don't. Um, I, you know, I do think that science has They've done a ton of work and come up with some great medicines that are, you know, more about biochemistry. Um, But, yeah, in the bigger picture, is it somewhat spiritual? I believe it is. You know, I I don't know. I I mean, now I'm looking at the big, big picture, sort of why we were put here to go through the journeys we go through where you know this is like earth school right and and we have lessons we come here to learn and when we go to the other side we'll hopefully understand what we learned and what we still might need to learn and come back to do in another life now i went way off track sorry no actually that's (laughs) right in line with a lot of what we've talked about here and it's it's in line with what we we we've shared amongst ourselves so no most most definitely uh so can i can i ask a question about solistein yes okay so where did your your grandmother's sister she had solistein yes what actually happened with her do you know yes um so she got very ill from the sterilization and it was clear my grandmother was trying to get her out of the hospital but because she had the diagnosis of schizophrenia there's no way they were going to let her leave Mm -hmm. um so it was clear at that point um the the family doctor and some other people knew where things were headed and the basically the doctor euthanized her 
which you know I think Sorry about that language. so I think that my I, I I think that my grandmother certainly believed that was the most merciful end she could come to at that time yeah, but the the way they euthanized at that time was the gas chamber, wasn't it? Well, no, th- partly, but that's not what happened to Rigmore. She was uh, euthanized with um, with medication. Oh, so, so you know, well, that that is more of a blessing, because, right? You know, like I said earlier, only took twenty to thirty minutes to die right. in the gas chamber. Right, absolutely, and and that's also documented in the book. Um, mm. So, did your grandmother used to go there to visit her? Yes, and that's why she knew her way around then. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah. So, how old was the sister Rigmore when, when, when she died? Uh, Twenty-five-ish. Okay. So young. How long has she been in there? Do you know uh, how long she was there? Yeah, she was there for. A year at least. You know, if if this was today, this wouldn't have happened, would it? They would more than likely have been able to treat her medication or something or other. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, she was a very talented. It was a needless death. Right. Well, there were many of them. Right. Right. And they were they were called mercy deaths, but they were merciless murders. That's right. Definitely. Uh, strange well, things in our history. Not... What's that, Irene? That's just not me for six. No. Nope. This headache's not getting any better either. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Sylvia, your book is titled Where Madness Lies. And uh, when did it come out? Did it come out this year? Yeah, February 1st. February 1st. Oh, two days before my birthday. Um, where can people find your book? Oh, pretty much any like big bookstore or Amazon. Or you can go to my website at sylviatrue.com. Fantastic. Uh, okay. Can I just ask one more question? Sure. Of course. What year was it when... Your um, grandmother's sister was euthanized. Um, she was thirty-nine. Do you know the year? Thir- Nineteen thirty-nine. Sorry. Nineteen thirty-nine. Yes. Okay, so that was before they started bringing in the gas chamber. It was right around, right before. Yes, they knew mm. what was coming. They absolutely knew what was coming. The doctor yeah. had already seen. You know, at, at Brandenburg, they had a trial sort of gas chamber. Yeah, I don't know demonstration if you want to call it that. And so it was clear that you know everybody was, or this big six institutions were getting ready to to build them. Yeah, and obviously, you know, like we said earlier on, uh, after Hitler closed down Sonnenstein and made it into a military hospital in 1942, the knowledge that they had got from that particular hospital was taken to places like Auschwitz. Right, absolutely. And that's where gas chambers started really taking off. Right, right. In the extermination camps. Yeah, the the psychiatrists were the ones who... um, helped design them in the concentration yeah. camps. It's amazing. Right. It's amazing the amount it, of people that were complicit in all of right, that. Right, right. Not it just is, the SS. I, I, I've just got no words for it. You know, I really have not got any words for what they done, the Holocaust and everything. It's... Something that shouldn't be forgotten. Should no. never be forgotten. Right. No. So I recommend for our listeners, if you want to pick up this book and uh, certainly read about Sonnenstein, and uh, I'm sure there's more that can be found online as well, but uh, definitely pick up Sylvie's book, 
uh, wherever books are sold. Uh, Sylvia, uh, we've come to the end of the program. I uh, just wanted to thank you so much for talking with us. Uh, like I said, I know we kind of got off a little off topic, but I think uh, a lot of it uh, was really, really connected. No, it was a great conversation. Thank you for okay. both for hanging out with me. And thank you, Irene, for visiting with my grandmother. That makes me feel so happy. Well, she was a lovely lady. Thank you. <laughs> and, and she would like to come back and give me some, some uh, clump tonight or say, you shouldn't have told her. You shouldn't have told her. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it was a great, truly a great gift for me, Irene. Seriously. Yeah, but since Thank I tell, you. I tell you one thing. Since I uh, since we spoke about that, I've had this tremendous headache. I messaged Mark, and I don't know where that suddenly come from. See how yeah. you feel after the show. See if it dissipates, or if you. Uh, well, I don't. I don't think it was the grandmother, but you know, it's well, some maybe some kind of information that's head. coming through. I don't. know. We have to see. We'll see. Okay. Mm. All right. Well, uh, again, Sylvia, thank you for coming on the show. It was wonderful having you and talking with you. Thank you for having me. And I want to yeah. thank everyone else. I'm going to get stuck in that book tonight. Don't worry, Sylvia. <laughs> okay, Irene. Enjoy. <laughs> all right. And I want to yeah, thank really uh, all of our listeners for tuning in to another edition of the Paranormal UK radio show, the flagship show here on the Paranormal UK radio network. And uh, we will be back next week with an all brand new show. Uh, Irene, you'll, you'll be here this time, won't you? Yes. Okay, good girl. (laughs) All right, well, thank you, everybody, and uh, have a great evening. All right, bye. 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 Bye.